DEF CON. We're going to make this fast. This is a short talk, so I'm going to just uh, get them rolling. Please come in, find a seat, um, and uh, enjoy your talk. Uh, without further ado, this is Haystack and Six Volts. Uh, let's give them a round of applause. All right, go guys. Hi there, I'm Six Volts. And I'm Haystack. I'm Haystack. And we're going to be talking about cheap tools for heavy trucks. So there's a lot of differences between cars and heavy trucks, and we're going to be talking about some of those. We're also going to be talking about the R&D problems we face and how we get around them. And uh, we're also going to do some very preliminary stuff about uh, networking protocols and standards. Uh, there's a lot to go over, so we're just going to dump it all in a white paper for you to read if you really care that much. Uh, we're also going to go over a new hardware tool that we built uh, that should save you some money if you want to start getting in, into truck hacking. And also go over some, some light truck hacking adventures uh, that we've had. Some quick, some quick notes. We're going to assume you're familiar with basic vehicle networking. If you're not, Google it. Um, we assume you're familiar with the idea that if you get on the CAN bus, you can do bad things. We are leaving out lots of details that are going to be in the white paper. Um, check the GitHub by the end of the week. Um, and a safety disclaimer, if you hook up to a truck and start buzzing it while it's moving, it, bad things could happen. Don't do that. We're not responsible if you do. We have done that. Do as we say, not as we do. So uh, trucks, as we talk about them, are really any big, anything with a big diesel engine in it. Uh, the thing that most people are familiar with are semi-trucks, uh, class eight over-the-road vehicles but also dump trucks, wreckers, uh, marine engines, generator, uh, big generators, uh, agricultural equipment, anything like that is all going to work largely the same way and is going to be made by the same people. Um, an exception, uh, diesel pickup trucks, so if you see Bubba in his uh, Cummins Dodge Ram, uh, that's just going to act like a regular, a regular passenger vehicle. So many of the components that are in trucks uh, have to be interchangeable. So you can get a Peterbilt truck with a, a Packard engine or with a Cummins engine, and you used to be able to get one with a CAT engine. Um, so that all of those parts have to work interoperably, like the, the brake controllers from different vendors, the engines, the transmissions. So they, they've had to agree to this standard so that all the electronics can speak to each other and, and the truck can actually work. So one of the major differences with heavy trucks is uh, if you do anything with passenger vehicles, a big part of your job is reverse engineering the protocol because every manufacturer has their own thing. Uh, with heavy trucks, with big diesels, uh, that's all been decided upon by the Society of Automotive Engineers beforehand, and it saves you a lot of time. Uh, so you may have read something in Wired recently. Those guys just took a standard and injected traffic, and sure enough, they were able to cause unintended braking and acceleration. So we're going to talk a little bit about the telematics attack surface. Most heavy trucks that are out on the road in a, in a fleet have a dash-mounted touchscreen that controls the driver's logs, navigation, gives them a, a way to communicate with the fleet, um, kind of like email, and in, in emergencies, contacts the fleet and allows the, the, the truck driver to talk back to them. Um, they use the cellular network to connect to the uh, telematics provider and the fleet, and these devices connect directly to the CAN and J1939 bus. Um, also the, the legacy 1708. Many of them run embedded versions of Windows, like Windows CE or XP embedded. Um, that's kind of scary to me. Talk about how easy they are to root. Uh, yeah, we've, we've had some luck with rooting them by doing things like popping an SD card out of the back. Uh, so a big problem that we had when we started getting into this is uh, trucks are expensive. A, uh, so like a Freightliner or Cascadia, something like that, can cost over 100 grand. Um, ouch, I do not have that kind of money. Uh, for the and for the aspiring hacker, even if you're rich, they are big, hard to store, hard to drive. Uh, I can drive a five speed, a six speed, a one down, four up speed, uh, but I can't drive a 14 speed. Um, and uh, they're also expensive to operate. Uh, so we, we didn't have one and we still don't. We're trying to get one. Uh, so how do we experiment? Uh, we built this thing. We call this the truck in the box. So this is a bunch of components out of a heavy truck. Um, the engine control module, the instrument cluster, there's a couple other things hiding in the back there, a power distribution unit, and a uh, national instrument CREO. We quit using that. But, and then the knobs are a bunch of uh, potentiometers for, si for sensors. Um, the first one took about six months to build and cost about $10,000, but that's still. Thanks, DARPA. <laughs> 
but that's still a lot cheaper than the cost of a truck. Um, since then, we've built over a dozen of those full-size ones for different uh, trucks and engines. Um, we later compressed the concept into the size of a circuit board, but that's not pretty, so we're not going to show it off. Uh, so the concepts of the truck in a box, um, we wanted to recreate the vehicle networks, including uh, J1939 and J1708. J1939 is built on CAN. J1708 is kind of RS-485. It's similar to J1850. Um, it, it also fakes passive uh, sensor signals. So uh, usually oil pressure sensors and temperature sensors and things are just, uh, they just measure voltage or resistance and ECMs. Uh, the engine control module tends to freak out if those things aren't, pres aren't present, so we're just trying to keep it from freaking out. Some of the more complicated signals are things like the accelerator pedal and the, uh, the way the, me the vehicle measures its road speed. This is the, a, uh, a tone ring that's on the back of the tail shaft underneath the truck. Um, on the left here, we've got the actual sensor, and that tone ring spins past that sensor generating a magnetic field, so we, we, we hooked one up in a, in a vise and hooked, put the sensor next to it, and then you get this kind of signal. So we can re RE that signal, figure out, characterize it, and then play it back to the ECM, and we can actually put miles on the truck on a bench. So I already talked a little bit about the two main uh, networking protocols, and uh, the J1708, like I said, it's RS-485-ish, 9600 baud. Uh, there's some slight transceiver differences. And then there's also another SAE standard called J1587 that specifies everything all the way up to the application layer. Uh, J1939 is similar, but it's built on 250K CAN. Uh, if you're into this, you know the passenger cars are 500K. Uh, we also see ISO 15765, but only for diagnostic comms. Uh, details in white paper, like all the different protocol details, if you wanted to write your own implementation, uh, we, should be, we, should, we should be able to give you enough information to do that. So for J1708, the uh, older protocol, messages are time delimited, and you've got these things called MIDs and PIDs. The, the MID is, is uh, analogous to the CAN ID. It's the first byte, and it tells you who on the network is talking. And the PID uh, is, comes right before any data uh, on the, in, in a message, and it comes, so PIDs and data come after the MID, and unpacking those PIDs and the data is how you figure out what messages say. Uh, mostly older trucks uh, will have only J1708. Uh, there was a period where there, they, they would have the, both networks, J1587 and J1939, at the same time. Uh, some newer ones will have components that use it. Uh, and then also there are these things called gliders. Uh, if, if you're a hot rod builder, you'd know it as a rolling chassis. People will, or, will order um, a truck with no motor in it. And the reason is is because uh, emissions regulations go by the date of manufacture of the motor and not the date of the truck. So they will have everything but the motor made. And these things will last for 2 million miles pretty easily, so they'll put the older motor in it. So you may see new trucks with old networks and old engines in them. So J1939 is the newer protocol, and it's based on 250K CAN. It's got extended IDs that are 29 bits long instead of 11 bit long IDs like, it, like they're in cars. Um, sometimes they, they have some basic specs for source and destination, but those aren't enforced. Um, there's address management, there's a transport layer, message fragmentation. There's about a dozen different documents that are, you can read through that are published by SAE, but they're all kind of thick. There's a couple of uh, parameter group numbers that are just like a, a message type that are reserved for proprietary communications, and those are the fun ones. And then also, um, there's the vehicle diagnostic link connector, which is called a DLC or a DLA. Uh, this industry is ter terrible at acronyms, so there's always like five acronyms for the same thing. Uh, it's similar to an OBD2 scan tool in a passenger car. Also, it's OBD, onboard diagnostics, like o not ODB, who is a founding member of the Wu-Tang Clan. People mess that up constantly, and it drives me a little nuts. Um, it's basically a USB uh, slash serial slash, slash Ethernet uh, to J1939 to J1708 bridge. These things are incredibly overpriced. They come at like seven or eight hundred dollars, and it's seriously just like I converted one thing into another thing, and it's two chips that they bought from someone else and soldered them onto a board. Um, the uh, the RP1210 is a standard that governs functions exposed by their drivers. 
So observing those driver calls is an excellent strategy for dynamic analysis of OEM software because they're always the same name and they always have the same arguments in the same format. So you can sort of get a running analysis of what the different software packages are doing at, at various stages of uh, ECM interaction. So we're releasing a new tool called the Truck Duck. It's a uh, cape for the beagle bone. It gives you two CAN channels and two J1708 channels. So you can do things like message filtering, recording, simulating an ECU. Uh, we've also got a custom OS image with the J1939 kernel extensions built in. Uh, and then he, Haystack wrote some stuff for uh, using it in Python. He's also written a, a J1708 implementation in the BeagleBones PRU, which is amazing. They're like little built-in microcontrollers on the thing. And uh, this is what it looks like. Um, over on the, the right-hand side, I've got the diagnostic link connector. That's the, the big DB15. I can't see the um, two screw terminals, those are the green guys, and then uh, it, it's got the power circuitry so that you can power it from the bus. So a, uh, another thing that, that we released is uh, a, an RP1210 tracer. So for a while, uh, when we would reverse engineer what, the, what uh, these software packages were doing and when we were trying to reverse engineer the proprietary uh, protocols, the best option was to buy a diagnostic link connector whose driver has debug logging capabilities. So you would flip a little switch in the, in the driver software and it would say, you know, I sent this, received this, received this, sent this. Um, the, only known, the only one we know of costs $700. It's like the Cadillac of DLCs. Uh, that can be a lot of money for some people, especially if you're just doing bench testing on an ECM that you got at a junkyard someplace like us. Um, and then I rolled a, uh, an RP1210 API tracer that logs results of RP1210 function calls so you're not dependent on the Cadillac of DLCs anymore. And uh, it works with any of them, including the cheap eBay clones uh, for all two weeks that they work. And uh, it allows you to decrypt and translate on the fly. And when we get kind of into the uh, what we did with this stuff section, uh, you'll see that a little bit. Um, but what is it good for? Like all that stuff I just went through, uh, all that in a buck will get you a cup of coffee uh, like 10 years ago. So, you know, what, what can you actually do with this? Um, we wanted, so we, we, we wanted an attack and we wanted to have a viable attack that could actually have some conceivable impact in the real world, uh, but we didn't have a truck. So this, this presents an issue. If you're not driving something, it's very difficult to tell when brakes are applied when you have no actual brakes. Uh, so we needed something that we could do in vitro. And uh, the solution was malicious ECM misconfiguration. So reverse engineer the protocol. Um, yeah, reverse engineer the protocol and then mod send messages using that protocol to, uh, to misconfigure the ECM. Um, so most of the parameter configuration is done over proprietary protocol extensions. Um, we promise not to give too many specifics out um, so that you can't do very bad things to trucks that are on the road because that would be pretty dangerous. Um, we're going to give a demonstration of what is possible with the, the, the truck duck and the API tracing. So this is some proprietary traffic. You can see the, the messages here. Here, I'll point you. So we can see the, the, the FE there in the middle, that, that indicates that this is a proprietary message and that, that's what you really want to look for. And the message down at the bottom is just a, a, something regular flowing across the bus. So initial notes from analysis of this protocol. Um, the same process, clicking the same buttons in the software yield, yielded uh, different network traffic every time. So this stuff was actually obfuscated slash encrypted. Um, which, which is kind of unusual. A lot of the different manufacturers, including uh, newer ECMs, this was a very old one, uh, they're not encrypted or, or disguised in any way. Um, messages that appear to do the same thing are the same length, so it's not too obfuscated. No one's like padding to a block length and then doing stuff, it, it, it's, a, it's simpler. And uh, this is where I yada, yada, yada passed a bunch of static analysis I did with Dot Peak and Ida because this is DEF CON and I don't wanna try to teach pros how to use dot peak and Ida. So after, um, after doing static analysis, I figured out 
the, uh, what the bytes after the first three are. The first three are specified by SAE. Uh, the first byte, First byte is the source. The second byte says, hey, this is proprietary and it's interesting. The third byte says this is the destination. In this case, this is the DLC talking to the engine. This next code is proprietary and that's a security setup. And then that, this low nibble over here uh, on both ends, these are kind of degenerate keys. There, there's obviously not a whole lot of entropy in a four bit key, but that's what they got. And uh, that, so they, they pre-share that uh, in order to carry out the, the rest of the protocol. So then there are, uh, I found other command codes. So this high nibble, uh, F was the security setup, D is an encrypted write, C is an encrypted read, and then E is an encrypted read-write response. So no matter if it's responding to a write or a read, it's going to be, uh, that, that, that's gonna be the format of the reply. The low nibble is the message code, and then there's this little formula where you take the pre-shared four-bit super high entropy key, add it to the code in the message mod four, and it indexes into a character array uh, that's buried in a DLL someplace. And then you just XOR it with everything. So it's XOR encryption made slightly less bad. So then uh, after we decrypt it, I modified the RP1210 API tracer to decrypt all this on the fly. And then the, uh, the pattern became a lot, more, uh, a lot more comprehensible. You can see that it's just a very standard call and response type protocol where you have a PID and then it says, hey, you know, six zero, I wanna see that. And then you get a bunch of ASCII characters. I'd have to look up what that is, honestly. And so uh, what could we do with this? So now that we, now that we have this, this degenerate encryption algorithm and we, we know the PIDs and we can trace this stuff, um, if we get on the bus, we can set parameters in the ECM. So uh, the one that we chose was a hard vehicle speed limit. So uh, the governors in heavy trucks are just a, a byte that you, that you write. And so we thought, hey, wouldn't it be cool if you just like froze a, a semi truck at only being able to go 30 miles an hour? But that's, that's still kind of boring because if you can get on the bus physically, if you can get physical access, you can just cut the brake lines. Um, you, you could compromise a telematics unit and then have it send these, uh, these messages during a key on engine off condition. But we wanted, we wanted to do a little bit more. So then uh, hijacking OEM software. Uh, software is used in day-to-day -day operations of the fleet. Um, all that, we've talked about fleets being data hungry before. Uh, and as a result, they are pulling data off these ECMs after every trip in, in many cases. And uh, that data, uh, or when, so they're always pulling this data. And so unlike where your passenger car, where unless you're throwing a check engine light and the dealership's putting it on a scanner, um, these things are interacting with software all the time. And so there are a lot of in, uh, opportunities for things to change. So I repurposed the API tracer. Um, so instead of just decrypting and logging things on the fly, uh, modifying, re-encrypting, and writing. So let's see what that looks like. Um, this is a screencast because showing the full ECM would give away the brand and I'm really bad at video editing. Also, I'm very sorry about the free version trademark. This stuff is expensive and this is on my own dime. Okay, so at the beginning, I started the kind of degenerate truck root kit. I very artfully blacked out the manufacturer uh, logo. This protocol is very slow, so I'm gonna try to patter a little bit while, while it's getting set up. So here you can see that the, uh, the vehicle speed was at 55 miles an hour. Our hypothetical technician knows his drivers can't drive 55, so he decides to bump it up to 70. And as far as anyone can tell, uh, that, that went fine. It was set to 70 miles an hour. And then after disconnecting, we go and check and make sure that, uh, that the truck mangler program is dead. And then so we actually see what happened. And again, we wait for the slowest vehicle protocol in the world. <laughs> 
for those who didn't hear the joke he made, Lynn is in fact very slow. But. There, so you know, we can see that in fact it was actually set to 30 miles an hour and this guy would have gotten about a mile down the road and, uh, and, and then would have had to realize that he had to turn back. And if you, if you manage to keep this running and get persistence, um, there would be no way to tell. So they would be checking mechanical issues over and over. So I think this is a very viable uh, attack with real impact. So for future work, we're going to work on writing an RP1210 driver for the truck duck to allow easier traffic modification. It's even cheaper than some of the eBay adapter clones that you can get. Um, we also want to work on making the PC side attack a little more interesting so that the technician doesn't have to actually modify a parameter. It can just do it once they connect to the truck. Um, we would really love to do some deeper firmware analysis on ECMs, you know, pull some chips, read some data, and do some static analysis. Um, we'll be in the hardware hacking village. And car hacking. And Car Hacking Village, if you have any questions. Uh, we'll also have an ECM and a bunch of live demos of this stuff, so it's not just a stupid screencast with a watermark on it. You can actually play with, with, uh, with this technology. Thank you very much.